Our first speaker will be Francis Govers, Govers, Francis Govers uh, of uh, SGI, and his talk is on meeting engineering challenges for future space exploration. Thank you, Tom. Hey, I'm uh, I'm Francis Covers. I work for Silicon Graphics Computers, or SGI, and we are uh, embarked on a uh, new project uh, that I'm in charge of to meet some of the challenges of designing the future, of uh, getting from where we are to where we want to be, especially those people that are here at this conference or are interested in space-faring civilization or interested in how we get to the moon, back to the moon and to Mars and cheap, cheap access to space and all of those goals. Um, I was uh, uh, fortunate enough to have breakfast with Dan Brandenstein yesterday, uh, who besides being the president of the National Space Society is the vice president of Lockheed for Consolidated Space Operations. And he said, you know, it's really sad that all of the Im improvements and productivity that have come from the internet and from the uh, rapid proliferation of computers have not helped the aerospace industry at all. We're still doing things the same way now that we did back in with very little changes. In some cases, with the very same people. But uh, I'm not saying anything wrong with those guys because they're they're uh, marvelous to work with. Um, but the the process of developing new spacecraft or developing new ideas or going from an idea to a piece of metal uh, in the aerospace business has not substantially improved over the last 20 years. And we are trying to change that uh, here at. Silicon Graphics. Um, you have probably seen some of our other work. Uh, if you've seen the Dodge or Chrysler commercials with the LHX and the Dodge Intrepid where they show how they use computers in a virtual test track and built the computers in virtual reality and they have all this, the car melts you know, in, in 3D right in front of your face. Not only is the technology that Chrysler uses to do the virtual testing from Silicon Graphics, but the technology they use to do that commercial came Silicon Graphics as well. Uh, both the, uh, the hardware that uh, it was done on and the software it was created on our Silicon Graphics products. Um, we have been very successful with that in the automotive industry. We've been very successful with these ideas in the oil and gas industry and in increasing the way that people have been looking for oil. And now we're looking to take that experience and bring it to the aerospace industry as well. And we have been calling this project, it's gone through a number of names. It was really inspired uh, last year at the ISDC and at the Mars Society conference that I attended last year um, were the inspiration for this project. Uh, and we have since presented to both the management of Silicon Graphics and the management of NASA, and both have been, been very enthusiastic, in fact, remarkably so, uh, with the concepts. So let me introduce it real briefly, and then we're going to talk about specifically about engineering and getting to Mars. Um, this is uh, NASA's definition. They had a uh, had a study, not surprisingly, lots of studies, but um, from the National Research Council on advanced engineering environments. In other words, saying, you know, what what do we need to to improve our engineering process? And this is what. The Natural, Re Natural, yeah, National Resource Research Council came up with. They said that you needed an advanced computational communications network facilities to create uh, links between the researchers, people coming up with the ideas, the technologies, the people who are figuring out how to apply those ideas, the designers, the manufacturers, the suppliers, and the customers. And we needed to have a common set of tools between those groups so that we could throw ideas into a virtual testing environment, figure out if they're going to work right on the spot, figure out how they're going to, how much they're going to cost, how much this is going to take, um, and make decisions based on that and not, you know, the process that we have now is somebody comes up with an idea, we do 5,000 presentations, we put them on view graphs like these, we take them to the board, 
They think about it, they look at that, and they scratch their heads and say, you know, this doesn't look right. But we don't have any real numbers, so we have to go back and redo the view graphs. But we go through about 60 iterations of that. Then someone says, okay, well, we'll, we'll think about building a prototype. And then the prototype is built with maybe metal, maybe a computer. Uh, it's a very long, involved process. Uh, there are a number of design reviews. And we want to take all that and shrink that dramatically. And so does NASA and so does industry. So uh, we're working on a partnership uh, with NASA to create a new kind, an entirely new kind of computer system called an advanced collaborative engineering environment that's going to uh, basically take the development process and put it on amplifiers. So uh, from that, you know, the background that we have is that there are a number of different kinds of simulations that can be used for this. Uh, it is, we are going to use a technique that's called design by simulation, which means that you, when you get the idea, you immediately build a prototype of it, you immediately put that in a testing environment, in a simulated environment, and you try it out right on the spot. So uh, there are a number of different kinds of sims that are around. Most people, when we say simulation, think immediately about training simulations. You think of flight simulators, like the ones we have out in our booth. Um, which are real-time simulations. It's one second of simulation time equals one second of wall clock time. But there are a lot of other kinds of simulations as well. In fact, there's a whole gamut of simulations. Some of the other kinds are engineering simulations where we're trying to test the properties of something. And those are usually slow time simulations where we are running many iterations per second. Uh, we may be looking you know, down to the wavelength or down to the down to the molecule in some cases, so depending on what, uh, what kind of an engineering system you're looking at. Um, or we, and then on the other scale, we have operational simulations, or oper OR or operations research sims, where we might be looking at a 30, 60, 90 day, or if we're going to Mars, a three year mission, uh, and looking at that in a very rapid fashion. In that case, time goes by very fast. So let's, let's go to the pictures here and talk about some of the um, problems getting to Mars, because that specifically is what we started with on this project. Now, since we've started with it, I've taken it, we've taken it to NASA and talked to them. They said, you know, we got problems we've got to solve first before we go to Mars. And uh, they're looking at uh, our techniques for uh, improving uh, processing time on the shuttle, for designing the next generation of reusable launch vehicles, for uh, working with the massive amount of data that's going to come back from Earth observing systems and the mission of planet Earth, uh, and then for the next generation of exploration vehicles. So it's, it's a lot more than just the Mars stuff. But we started with Mars stuff, and I know a lot of folks here are interested in it. So we'll talk about that. Um, this is, uh, we're going to mix here a little bit of um, Bob Zubrin's uh, Mars Direct Plan from uh, Case from Mars, from his book and with the uh, NASA reference mission, uh, which is a derivative of uh, a combination of the original uh, Mars plans and the and, uh, Mars direct. So sometimes called Mars semi-direct. But, um, and talk about it in terms of engineering challenges. Um, I got to go to the Kennedy Space Center here recently and present this to the folks at KSC. And this is the first slide I put up for them as well. This is a Ares launch vehicle. It's a shuttle derivative um, design that came, uh, Dr. Zuber came up with. Uh, but it's similar to, I'm going to show you NASA's version of this in just a second. It's got four shuttle main engines on the bottom and then two extended solid rocket boosters. This smaller piece in the middle is the old external tank, and then sitting on top of it is a very large cargo pod, which houses an entire Mars landing. Uh, and this, you see that big number one on there, that would be flight number one of three that would, that would uh, represent a single Mars mission. Uh, so the first thing that the, uh, the guy who showed this at Kennedy said, well, you know, we don't have a launch pad big enough to hold that thing. The uh, launch pad that they've got now is just not strong enough to take this kind of power. Uh, it's designed around the shuttle, and uh, so new launch pads. First thing we're going to need is a new launch pad. A new launch facility is going to be required. Second thing is it's a whole lot taller than the shuttle. So it will fit in the vertical assembly building uh, that we have now, because that, of course, was designed for the Saturn V. So that one's OK. The uh, launch facility has got to be redesigned. 
This is NASA's version of it. This is off of, I got this from NASA's website. And this shows, rather than the engines being all on one side and one pod, it's got two pods. And it's a little more streamlined, but it's the same basic idea. Uh, just the uh, NASA artist version of it. The previous one was my rendition. So here are a few uh, possible designs for uh, Mars, very heavy cargo lift vehicles all derived off shuttle pieces. So we take the pieces that we've already got and we engineer them to lift heavy mass with them. So we take our basic shuttle, we can add an aft cargo carrier under the bottom of the external tank. We can add cargo vehicles on top. We can add a cargo module, which is usually called shuttle C, a cargo pod with basically a shuttle with no wings and just engines on the side. And then the top one was a new one. I hadn't seen this one before. This is a unmanned three sets of SRVs stacked up with a cargo pod on top of the top SRV. So all of these are, this is, this is the, iter the design process. So we come up with a bunch of ideas and we throw them out on the table. And here they are. Here's, you've just seen um, one, two, three, four, five, six heavy lift launch vehicles. So we would want to take all these ideas and throw them into our supercomputer and start crunching numbers against them. And start saying, you know, what's the thrust going to be? What's the lift going to be? What's the structure going to be? What's the, how are we going to control it? How are we going to, what avionics are we going to need? And start putting those very quickly into a integrated environment and start testing these things out. So we spent a great, here, oh, here's, here's a fifth one. So, okay, so we spent a great deal of time, the, our initial study, I mean, we're not only using this prototype technique that we talked about to improve the process of building the spacecraft, we're also using it to improve the process of building our software. So the advanced collaborative engineering environment is being built in the same prototype manner that we are using, that we would use to build something like this. This is the top stage of a prototype Mars lander. Uh, this is the very top of that big stack that we saw just a minute ago. And we, this was our initial scenario that we were studying to look at how we would use our advanced collaborative engineering to study something. So we, we needed something to study, first of all, to kind of design our environment around. So it's, it's in this iterative process that we use, we have to say, you know, what are we going to use it for? What are our goals? What are our needs? And then we design around that, but then you're saying, oh, we got this good idea, we're just going to build it first and we'll figure out what we're going to do with it later. Uh, this process is you figure the goals are set first and the design follows the goals rather than the other way around. Uh, it, it may be amazing to some folks, but most software these days are built with, uh, we'll build it first and we're going to figure out what we're going to do with it later. And, uh, which is not always a very good approach to use. Okay, so in this scenario, we're gonna, I'm going to take you through a scenario and then we're going to talk about the engineering challenges of the scenario and then talk about how uh, what we're doing is going to help make this make the world a better place and make this happen much, much faster than it would otherwise. So here we are going to Mars. We're up where we've left, we've, uh, left the Earth. We've had the trans-Mars injection. So we fired the top of this third stage uh, and we're on our way to Mars in our, our lander here. And um, the next thing we're going to do is uh, get rid of this aero shell that's over the top of the lander. This is one possible scenario of a mini. But in this particular case, we've got an uh, aero shell comes off the lander from the top stage here and falls away. This is a very familiar scenario. And then it exposes the lander. The uh, uh, third stage separates. Now this third stage is now completely empty of fuel and releases the lander. So what we're going to do now is in order to get one of the scenarios for getting to Mars, one of the new ideas, one of the new concepts was, you know, uh, the big complaint that you hear from a lot of the um, medical scientists is that we should not spend eight months in free fall getting to Mars. If we get an eight month trip out, eight month trip back, which is one of the, the plans, then we should not spend that entire time weightless because you know, you're going to have to do heavy work once you get to Mars. You're going to be there for an extended period of time. 
it would be nice not to reach a, reach their uh, weakened state. And you want to keep your muscle mass, you want to keep your bone mass. So it wouldn't be nice if we had artificial gravity on our hands from our spacecraft. So uh, one of the ideas for doing that is to use the spit third stage from the Aries launch vehicle, our heavy lift launch vehicle, use that as a counterweight and spin the HAB module with a tether attached to this empty third stage. So here's my, this is my rendering of this maneuver. So the HAB module separates, it turns around, very uh, reminiscent of the Apollo days when we did this with the lunar module. Uh, it comes back in, you can see it's got its own reaction control system on the top there. Uh, comes in and grabs the tether off the top of the third stage and starts unreeling this tether. Tether's about uh, 1,500 feet long. It's a six-strand uh, Hoyt tether, which was invented by uh, Robert Hoyt and uh, Dr. Robert Forward from Tethers Unlimited. So we're using their design. Uh, it's a six. It's a multi-strand failure tolerant uh, arrangement. And then once we're getting close to the end of railing out the tether, uh, once again the HAB module fires its jets and starts rotating the whole mass around the tether. And around and around we go. So let's get here where we can see it. There we are. We're on our way to Mars. So we're out of Earth orbit. So, and this is at any time. Once everything's all settled down, the trans Mars is fine. Everybody's happy with the course. Then we'll do this. So we've got some some um, engineering challenges with uh, performing this maneuver. Now, the maneuver itself is fairly simple and is exactly the same as the old um, Apollo version of go pick up the lunar module out of the third stage and drag it out. Exactly the same flight. Yes. Third stage is completely empty at this point. It's all, it all takes place on the other end. Yes. And, yeah. Well, there's, there's more questions. So, yeah. That's, so let me, let me get through the end of the scenario here so we can tell you about what, you know, what we're looking at. First of all, we've got a 1,500-foot long tether with six strands. The, um, uh, there is some elasticity in the fiber that makes up the strand, so that means it stretches a bit. If it stretches, that means it stores energy and will sometime later release that energy. So if you stretch it out, at some point in time, it's going to want to stretch back. Um, as we're going along, we're going to have to make course corrections. We're going to have to uh, have communications continuously while the spacecraft is spinning. We're going to have to have thermal properties to say, you know, we need an equal amount, this is probably the easier part of it, but an equal amount of sunlight on either side of the HAB module so that it doesn't get too hot or too cold on one side or the other. Um, and then there are all the failure modes. What happens if the, if the tether breaks? What happens if, it, uh, if a, say, a thruster gets jammed on on the uh, HAB module in? Uh, can this be, you know, how, what, how does this go out of control and how do we fix it? Finally, there are all the modes of the tether itself, which is, just, after all, a long piece of string. It's also going to propagate waves. It's going to, uh, uh, Dr. Forward talks about jump rope modes and, and uh, swing modes, and, uh, and then the whole thing is a giant pendant. So we've got to be able to spin it up, we've got to be able to spin it down, we've got to be able to get out of this at the other end, so all this stuff has to be set. So we would be able to take this system, and this is our first, was our first prototype that we started looking at to build enough of this system in the computer to test these concepts out and see how well they could work. And we could work with a, we'll start with an infinitely strong tether, figure out how much stress is on each segment of the tether, divide it up into a bunch of little segments, calculate the stress of each segment, and do what's called finite element analysis on the, on the tether itself, do stress analysis on the spacecraft, on the ends of it, and then fly the maneuvers and see how they work out. So, the, so the, the system that we're working on is designed to make all this happen, and designed to do it very quickly. So let me show you a little more on the other set of slides here. Yeah. 
but I've not been there. So uh, some of the things that we would do with the system are uh, cost-benefit analysis, figuring out how things cost and how, you know, which trade-off would have the best benefit for the cost. Uh, cost is an independent variable. It's something that logistics guys talk about as far as if I change the dollars, what happens to the design. Uh, doing design reviews, figuring out how something's going to work so that you can say, yeah, this is a good idea, no, this is a bad idea. Doing risk assessment. Developing scenarios, processes, and procedures. Uh, that is actually a very critical part is to say, okay, if we're going to do deploying this tether, how does that work? How do we get it spun up? How do we get it spun down? Uh, that kind of scenario development. Uh, doing feasibility studies, which is what we're just looking at. Uh, and then finally, what I'm doing right now, doing outreach and presentation. And then um, the final one is to getting various groups together and have doing collaborative design in real time. So we would have a whole group of people, not physically together, but virtually together, all looking at the same thing at the same time, but each having their own independent view of what's going on. And being able to um, take a look at it. I'm going to jump through some of these slides because there are about 900 slides here. Um, so what we're doing right now is to create a facility uh, we're doing it in cooperation with NASA. We're part of the ISC, or trying to become part of the ISC Intelligent Synthesis Environment program that's already underway at NASA to create better tools. And, uh, and this is one of them. Uh, I'm going to show you the pieces here. These are the parts that make up what we're now calling RACI, or the Rapid Advanced Collaborative Engineering Environment. I hate acronyms, so we had to come up with a good one though, because you're not going to get through an answer without a good acronym. Um, the uh, the uh, system itself comes together with a number of front end pieces. Uh, there are a couple of rather unique parts. One of them we call the plumber's helper. Uh, the plumber's helper is designed to look at um, this sort of a problem. Let me get down to the slide here where we've got a uh, number of fuels, um, oxidizers, and we're going to run out some manifolds, and we've got to wire all this up, and then we've got to put valves on all that, and we've got to put checks on all that. Uh, that takes quite a while to simulate in a normal environment, so the plumber's helper is a very rapid drag and drop, you know, this goes here, that goes there, sort of connection. Um, here is my prototype. I did this for another project. Uh, back when I was coming up with this concept. This is the fuel system on a DC-9. <coughs> Excuse me. Created in the same sort of environment. Uh, and here you see, even in, it's in 3D, but all of the, I don't have the Linux sim here, but the fuel actually comes out. When you go into the cockpit and flip on the switches, the pumps turn on, the valves turn on, the fuel moves through the system, the turbines turn, the uh, valves move, the, pumps spin that you see, the various pumps there, there everything's color coded. So it's very easy to go flip, in the, flip the switches on the cockpit and run back to this diagram, which I call a living schematic, and see what's going on very immediately. So it's a very intuitive, very easy to deal with to go from the, the physical reality to the, the virtual reality and see what's going on. So. Um, we also have an ability to build any number of control panels um, in the system, and the control panels can look like absolutely anything. So this is one I built. This is actually an electrical panel out of the shuttle. I just grabbed the shuttle manual, and in about two hours, I had this control panel. It's a, a 3D rendered control panel, but everything in it works. Yes. Um, this is designed with uh, to integrate a much larger set of uh, circumstances, and we can certainly incorporate MATLAB and other types of small models inside of it. But uh, this has behind it a, a, a fairly large supercomputer and a parallel architecture that's designed to scale with the hardware. So it integrates across these systems. So you take a MATLAB sim, you take a finite element sim, you take a thermal sim, and you put them all together with this frame. So it doesn't do any one of them, it does them all together. And it does it with a supercomputer behind it so that you can see the results in real time. And uh, the scalability part is so that we can add CPUs or add parts, add compute power to our system 
and our ability to solve problems goes up in a linear fashion, which is not a trivial thing to do, but that's something that we at Silicon Graphics are very, very good at. Um, our biggest computer right now is a single computer. It's a uh, 1,000, let's see, we've got 512 CPUs are shipping now in commercial quantities, and uh, 1,028 CPU systems coming out. Uh, the first two are the first ones going to Ames, the second one's going to Los Alamos. And then we have the ASIC e mount, which is a cluster system, but it's got 4,198 CPUs. So we have some pretty good computers for running this stuff on. Um, uh, getting back to the control panels, uh, so the control panel can look like just about anything. This one actually lives on a web page and is powered by Java. So it can, be, it can run on virtually any computer that's out there. Uh, it also could look more like a regular web page. This is this one I put together that does this, some of the same functions. Uh, that looks more like a, uh, this one was designed to go with a touch screen so that it could be operated as well. So our vision of this is when we're in there studying these problems, so we'll be able to create a simulation in a very rapid fashion and have a whole group of people coming in to it either, either virtually or physically and having the electrical guys here and the thermal guys there and the structural guys there and so on and have them all working on one big picture but each seen in their own way. Now we're also adding to this uh, some other unique pieces, a uh, data mining tool that lets you look at huge amounts of data very, very quickly. Uh, that's a bit of a specialty of mine. Uh, we're going to be able to, to create virtual displays with any kind of information in large numbers of variables uh, and be able to see some of this abstract information on a very rapid basis. So it's, it's a very exciting development. Um, I'm going to go back to the pictures here and talk a little bit more about getting to Mars and some of the other engineering challenges that we're looking at. Uh, we are expecting, uh, we have invited a number of smaller companies, by the way. One of the things that I wanted to do with this project very, as, a, as an NSS member was to do some outreach with some of the smaller aerospace companies that are just getting started. And two of them that uh, kind of volunteered to help us out. The big one has been uh, Tethers Unlimited. Not too surprisingly, you're seeing all the tethers here. Uh, and uh, Dr. Forward and um, uh, Rob Hoyt have been very both supportive and have contributed ideas to the concepts that we've got here. Uh, the folks at Rotary Rocket have indicated that they would like to be a part of a program. And uh, we're going to try to provide both free computer time and all of this software that you're seeing here to those companies under NASA's uh, uh, Institute for Advanced Concepts and make, that a bit, make this, both the supercomputers behind it and the software that runs on it, uh, available to these little aerospace companies so they can do their feasibility analysis and they can do their uh, cost benefits and so on run their simulations at uh, very, well, we get two benefits out of this. They get to be, I want them to go from being little aerospace companies to being big aerospace companies, because then they're going to be my customers. Very, very happy about that. And the second thing is, is we would like to see this tool become popular in the, out in the aerospace industry itself, and this is one way to make it happen. And the third one is, is NASA's contributing to the development of this, and contributing both money and expertise uh, that then becomes a government-owned product, and uh, uh, people should be able to benefit from what the government spends their money on. And this is going to be hopefully another successful spin-off of the space program. So let's uh, finish our, our little tether picture here. I think we've got just a little more spinning around to do. Um, this is the next step in the process. Once we've gotten to Mars and we've dropped that tether, We've now got to get back into the atmosphere. Now we've been looking at inflatable HAB modules, and this is a semi-inflatable HAB module because I can't, still can't figure out where I put the crew when the, the module is deflated. So, uh, so I'm still working on that part of it because when it's deflated, there's no space in there. It's completely you know, the HAB module we're looking at now. When they're deflated, there's no room in there. So the next question is, if you have an inflatable HAB module, how do you get it out of orbit and down to the surface of Mars? Do you deflate it in orbit and then take it down? And if so, where do you put the crew? So you put them on a little crew module on top, uh, which I'm going to show you the picture of in a second, but those are still coming up. And anyway, you need a big heat shield. And we either look, you know, we, uh, looked at this heat shield, which is an unfoldable, big, umbrella-looking heat shield. 
uh, very unwieldy, lots of mechanical parts, very complex, or just using the top, that arrow shell that we threw away 15 pictures ago, uh, we may put heat tiles on that and use that arrow shell as a, as a re-entry vehicle. And then, oh, it might, not, might have some nice, make some nice um, aerodynamic, aerolifting capability to it so that it both aero brakes and re-enters in a nice controlled fashion. That would be good. So um, I think that, that part of it is going to win. So this is what it looks like from the ground as we're going overhead. This picture courtesy of NASA. And then we've got to do something, deploy some parachutes, to fire some rockets. Let's say we have parachutes for part of the way down and rockets for the last you know, 150 feet or so so we can pick a landing spot. Um, this is NASA's picture of Robert Zubrin's in-situ resource utilization module. This is the, the uh, reference mission version. When you can see all of the uh, 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 machinery there on the outside of it to convert the Mars atmosphere into fuel, which takes uh, hydrogen as a catalyst and converts that into methane and oxygen to use both as a fuel to get back up in orbit and as a fuel for the rover, which you see, oh, that's the nuclear powered rover. Uh, for the rover you're going to see in the next couple of slides. Here's the NASA version of the HAB module. I showed you mine just a second ago. This is NASA's one. This has got to be the strangest spaceship design I've ever seen. But it's kind of neat in that it's got wheels on the bottom. And once you land on the surface, you can pick up the landing legs and drive around. And so if you have more than one of these, you can wheel on over to the other one and put them together and make a bigger station out of it. So as the, you know, part of Mars direct concept was to build up a base over time. So um, we actually have mobile have modules, kind of a wagon train on Mars concept. And there you see the bigger rover with some uh, solar power things on it. So all of this stuff needs to be studied. Here's another picture of them kind of put together. These slides again, these really pretty renderings are from NASA. They spent a lot more time on it than I did. Um, and here we see a, uh, another version with a rover and a lander. You see the little crew module on top. I think we may need that little Apollo looking thing on top of an inflatable cab module for the crew to ride in just for the ride down to the surface and just for the ride up until we get the cab module there. That might work. But that's another piece of engineering. Now you've got a whole other spacecraft to build. Another concept that we we were struggling with, and I was um, one of the lead designers on the space station. And we had this, um, and I'm running out of time here, so I'm about to wrap it up. Um, the last concept that we had was, was the concept of morphing spacecraft, which is a spacecraft that lives for some part of the time it's on the shuttle, so it's part of the shuttle system. And then you go up and you plug it into another spacecraft, and now you're, at some point it's independent, and at some point it's plugged into yet a third spacecraft. And in a Mars mission, we may have a number of modules that go from from spaceship to spaceship to spaceship, or from vehicle to vehicle to vehicle, and we have to figure out how to control those systems and integrate those systems across those spacecraft, and that means coming up with standards and coming up with commonality. Where, you know, like today, you go buy a toilet, and you expect that it's going to go in your house, and it's going to fit on that hole that you have in the floor, and it's going to connect to your water, and it's going to work. Well, the architects long ago, and the, the plumbers, decided, well, we're going to standardize all this crap so that, your pardon the expression, so that you don't have to worry about you know what size toilet you have. You know, there's just a couple of sizes, and, and they all pretty much fit in the same spot. And they all hook up the same way, and they all work the same way. And so we can build buildings quickly without having every time we build a building, we got to re-engineer the damn toilet. So that's what we want to come up with in the space business: is a commonality of architecture, so that we're not rebuilding the wheel every single time for every single mission. So with that, I will stop, take a breath, and uh, ask for questions. We are building tools. We are a tool maker. So we make tools. No, I'm taking other people's designs and validating. And we're using the designs, these these pictures, as a proof of concept for what does the tool need to do. So these are, this, we're at the prototype phase now saying this is what we, these are the results we need. We need to validate that. And how do we validate that? 
Ms. Frum. Can I um, use this to tie, let's say, import a file for the design tool like the import trajectory analysis for another tool, use this to reflect on the vehicle and animate it? That's exactly the concept we're looking at. So we've done the interface for that. Yes, we have a whole, I skipped the slides, but there was a, there was a <laughs> really long list of CATIA, ProE, Intergraphics, Mass Trans, uh, IcePack, which is a thermal program, and so on. Let me take this one lady's questions and then we'll give the next speaker. Yes, ma'am. Yes. You had your hand up quite a while. Okay. Uh, what is regarding your business? So, the